Hello, everybody. Good morning from New Zealand. Good, good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to another episode of Learn Live in our series about Bicep and GitHub Actions. Today, we'll be talking about testing Bicep code by using GitHub Actions. Uh, my name is John Downs. I'm an engineer at Microsoft and the Fast Track for Azure team, and I'm joined by Chris. Hi, Chris. Hey, John. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Uh, we also have another person with us today, uh, Mauro, who is going to be our moderator. So if you are going to join us in the chat today, um, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear any questions or any thoughts you've got. Uh, and Mauro will be uh, answering questions as well as passing some of them through to Chris and to me to, to answer as well. Now, today we're going to be focusing this discussion on our GitHub Actions content. And we're following along with the Microsoft Learn module um, around testing Bicep code by using GitHub Actions. I should note, we also have an equivalent module uh, for Azure Pipelines. So if you're using Azure Pipelines, then um, you can uh, follow along with that Learn module. We're not going to talk about that today, but a lot of the concepts we're talking about today will be pretty similar, uh, just that the way that you implement will be a bit different. Also today, we're going to be doing a lot of exercises um, and, and Chris is going to be showing us how a lot of this stuff actually works. So Chris, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Sure, yeah. Thanks, John. So I guess the purpose of this module is really focusing on the testing side and looking at um, how you use GitHub Actions to do things like linting and validating and overall using GitHub Actions to automate that infrastructure as code deployment. So for what we're doing today, we need to do a little bit of setup. So we won't be going through that in the module because we've got tons of content to go and cover here today. Um, so what we'd suggest is if you do want to follow along with us, maybe when we're going through some of the slides and some of the content, um, check out the Learn module here um, and just go and follow the instructions. So you need to go to a template repository, um, go and copy that into your own profile there, um, clone the repository locally or you could use something like GitHub Code Spaces, which we might see later today as well. Um, and then what you'll need to do is go and uh, create a workload identity, which I believe you talked about last week, John. Actually. We did. We talked about them in excruciating detail last week. <laughs> so if for anyone who follows along last week, um, similar kind of steps to what you did last week. Um, there's a load of instructions there as well. Um, and then you'll need to take the secrets that you get from those workload identities and bring those back into your GitHub repository. So all of this was more like setup stuff that we felt would kind of break the flow of the session here today and kind of take away from what we're trying to learn here. So um, go ahead, do that in the background and um, any questions along the way, let us know, but um, we'll see you for some exercises a bit later. Awesome, thank you, Chris. So today we're going to, we've got a few objectives that we want to look through and, and Chris hinted at these before. We're going to talk about all of these things. We're going to talk about adding code linting for bicep code. We're going to talk about uh, pre-flight validation. Uh, we're going to talk about what if, um, so to preview what changes our deployments will make. And we're also going to talk about testing or verifying our configuration once it's actually deployed. So there's quite a lot that we're going to cover today. Mm. And I guess that just to take a step back for a second, just to remind you, so a few weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago, I think, Gitter and April presented the first of the, se the, the, the sessions in this season, um, showing you a basic deployment workflow for Bicep deployments using GitHub Actions. And today, what we're going to do is take that deployment process and extend it, right? So that, that basic deployment process really just deploys a Bicep file without thinking too much about, you know, is that Bicep file valid? Are there, is it doing what we're expecting it to do? So today we're going to start adding some additional uh, pieces to that to that workflow to make sure that it's actually doing what we expect it to do and that it's going to meet our quality standards. Now, as with all of the learn modules that we talk about, we have an example scenario that we work through. And so we, we let's say that we're the um, Azure administrator at a toy company, and we've been working with our team to create this Bicep file uh, that deploys and configures all of the inf uh, infrastructure and the resources for our website. We've also been working on this Bicep deployment workflow uh, using GitHub Actions. Now, let's just say that for some reason, we've had some, some issues recently where some people in our team or, or some things have happened that have, have resulted in some mistakes. And we're worried that some of these mistakes might cause us to have production outages at some point. So what we want to do is add testing to our Bicep deployment workflows so we can ensure that they, the workflow and that the, the deployments have the best chance of succeeding. 
right? So we don't want to just jump straight into a deployment. We want to do some, some quality checks before we get to that point. So in this module, we're going to learn how to do all this, right? We're going to learn how to do all of these different steps, linting, validation, preview, then of course, deployment, and then some post-deployment testing. And the goal is that by the time you finish this module, then you'll be able to take your own bicep deployment workflows and update them uh, to include some of these kinds of validations and tests and so forth. All right, so let's get started by talking about some of the concepts that we're going to be working with today. And the big concept that we're going to be introducing to our workflows is this idea of a job. Now, just thinking about workflows as a whole. So workflows give us the ability to automate all of the steps in our deployment process. And so we might have lots of different things that our deployment process needs to do. Uh, we can then group those into these things called jobs. So jobs are a collection of steps that all perform a, a kind of a similar kind of process or, or that are part of a process. So jobs can be used to mark what I kind of think of as a separation of concerns, right? So for example, when you're, you're working with bicep code, validating the code is one kind of concern. But that's a separate concern from deploying the code. And so it it's, might be a good idea to keep those as kind of separate things. But there might be multiple steps involved in performing each of those different stages, right? And, and performing the validation and performing the deployment. We also think about things like continuous integration and continuous, uh, continuous deployment. So CICD, you might have heard of these. So continuous integration is usually about taking some code assets or some, some kind of information that's, that's in a Git repository or similar. Um, and that's, um, uh, and that's, that's kind of one logical part of our pipeline or our workflow. Uh, and then the second part is deployment, right? It's, it's taking the, the artifacts that have been compiled or that have been built as part of that continuous integration process and deploying it. So if you've heard about that continuous integration, continuous de uh, deployment, separation, then, then jobs are one way that we might be able to achieve some of that separation as well. It's probably worth adding in there, John, as well, that, you know, if we think of that deployment aspect as well, typically you have multiple environments like a dev, a QA or a prod, or maybe even, mm -hmm. you know, in some cases for some applications, multi-region deployments as well. So that could again yes. be a great contender for having separate jobs. Absolutely, yeah. And in fact, we won't be talking too much about environments today, but next session, um, just to give you a preview, there is a whole discussion on how you do exactly that, and that builds a lot on the concepts we'll talk about today. So that's a really good point. Now, the goal that we're, we're trying to meet here is that as our deployment progresses, as the workflow runs further and further, we should be getting increasing confidence that the changes that we're going to make will be successful. Right. So at the very start of the deployment, at the start of the workflow, um, we might not be 100% sure that everything that's been, been checked in or that's, that's about to be deployed is actually okay. Um, but as we go through all of these different steps and, and these different jobs, then we want to increase the likelihood that, that our deployments will succeed. So thinking about jobs, so typically jobs will run in parallel by default. And this is a really important point. We're going to talk about this in a bit more detail shortly. Um, so we can configure our um, our jobs in different ways, um, but but it, by default they will run in parallel. Um, we can also configure different types of jobs, including rollback jobs, and we'll talk about these a little bit later on. Um, these are things that we can kind of control the, the the flow of our deployments and our workflows in some interesting ways. Now, because we're using jobs here, and, be, and, and because we're trying to add this additional uh, these additional checks and this additional quality control, what we sometimes what we're doing here is, is referred to as shifting left. So imagine if we've got a timeline of all of our activities that we, we take from when we first think about a change that we're going to make through to when it's actually deployed and then supported. Well, if there's any kind of problem, if there's a mistake in our implementation or something that's not going to work well because of a, a design constraint or something like that, we want to find those things early, right? The cost to fix problems gets higher the later we wait. And so the, the worst case scenario really is that we don't find a problem until after it's been deployed, in which case we have to do a whole bunch of work to kind of debug, figure out where the problem is, and then go back and do all the work again uh, and rip out the original implementation and, and change it. And that, that's obviously very expensive. But if we can find problems early, if we can find them even before we start really, um, or before the deployment starts, then we can quickly look at the problem, try and resolve it, and, 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 and hopefully not even touch our production environment uh, until that problem has been resolved. And this is the beauty of uh, things like being able to have protections in terms of merging code into our main production code base as well. Things like Absolutely. security, hugely top of mind these days. 
And if we can even find security issues before we get to production as well, great uh, in terms Absolutely. of shifting left out here. Absolutely, yeah, and and I think there's some really interesting tooling and things that we'll we'll um, provide some links to through through uh, later in the module about how you can do things like integrating security tests into the kind of process that we're going to be building today. Um, you can also do some interesting things with things like pull requests, right? So we're we're going to talk about these in a separate um, a separate session later in the series. But just to give you a preview, um, one of the things that you can also do here is get uh, get some validation of the code that's about to be merged into your main branch before it's even merged, right? You can actually verify that the code that's that somebody is proposing is going to work well for the scenario, and you can run both manual kind of validations and also automated checks to see how well that deploys and, and if, it, if it meets all of your test criteria and so forth. So that's another kind of uh, example of how we can shift left um, to, to, you know, to, to increase the quality of our deployments. Now, one thing that's really important to understand with all of these concepts is there's nothing magic going on here, right? This is all code that we're writing ourselves. These are all kind of policies or tests or validations that we decide on. And so we need to work out what makes sense. Right, the, the tools, the GitHub Actions and so forth will do a really good job of running all of those things for us, but we need to tell it what to do. And so we need to make sure that we understand what are all the steps involved so that we're confident that a deployment is okay. And we'll talk about some things that we can do for Bicep throughout the session today. So going back to jobs, each workflow contains at least one job, right? That's, that's all workflows have a job, uh, but then you can define additional jobs to suit your requirements. And uh, as I said before, jobs run in parallel by default. So if we think about separating out our, our validation from our deployments, just as a simple example, well, if we don't tell GitHub Actions otherwise, it will do something like this. It will run the validate and the deployment stages at the same time. And that probably doesn't make sense because we actually want to validate before we start deployments. In this case, we're also doing some deployments where we want to deploy across regions, like Chris was talking about before, right? We want to deploy the same application to both a US region and a Europe region. Um, and, and it might be okay for us to deploy those two things in parallel, but we want to make sure that validation happens first. So what we can do instead is move to a model like this, where we say, well, we want the validate job to happen first, and then everything can happen in parallel after that. Right. So thinking about all of these different pieces of our workflow, thinking about how they're going to be modeled, what kind of uh, order they've got they need to go in is a really important part of this. And it's often a good idea to just sit down at a whiteboard and start thinking about this um, before you start writing too much code, just so that you have a good picture of what your workflow is going to look like before you get too far into the development. Now, one thing to note is that I'm saying here that, that jobs run in parallel. Uh, that is true. But depending on the number of GitHub runners that you're using, um, the, the number of actual jobs that will run at the same time might be different. So um, there's a whole bunch of stuff here to know about kind of how GitHub Actions is built and, and, and some of the things around the pricing and so forth that we won't get into today. Uh, but just be aware that, that, yes, that they can run in parallel, but they may or may not, depending on exactly how you've got your environment set up. So what we're wanting to do today is, is and just of course to remind you that the, the, the idea here is that we've got these things called runners. These are the actual machines or the, the infrastructure that runs the, the workflow as well, right? So this diagram here is just kind of reminding you, um, hopefully you remember this from, from before when April and Gitter were talking about this, but runners are the, the actual infrastructure that run your deployment uh, and then the workflow runs on those runners. Now, as I mentioned before, you can also put in some additional conditions here. So it's not just about kind of sequencing of deployments. You can also put in things to say, for example, when a previous job has failed, then run a rollback, right? Or when a previous job has succeeded, then carry on with the next stage uh, or possibly allow the workflow to end, end successfully. So we'll talk about rollback a little bit later on in the session as well, because there's a few things to be aware of here, uh, but the tooling definitely does support you doing some really interesting things here. All right, so Chris, I think we've talked enough and, and looked at enough slides. So do you want to uh, go through how this might look in actual YAML files and then how this looks in GitHub Actions? Yeah, sure. So I think let's take a look at doing some linting and validation to start off with here. So we've got the repository here. So if you did uh, complete the steps that we talked about a little bit earlier, um, you'll end up with a repository that looks a little like this. And hopefully you've added some secrets and things into your repository as well. Um, so what we'll need to do is we need to have somewhere where we can go and edit that code. So 
the Microsoft Learn docs actually go and say, um, clone that locally, use um, your local editor. Um, I'm going to do something a little different here. There's a couple of options that you have uh, within GitHub. Of course, you can go and hit that green code button, get the URL, clone it locally, edit there. Um, alternatively, what I'm going to be doing is using something called GitHub Code Spaces, which is an on-demand um, development environment that we can go and use. So it gives me everything that I need at my fingertips um, in kind of seconds to minutes. So what I've actually got in this other tab here is something that looks suspiciously like Visual Studio Code, um, but it's in my web browser hosted over in GitHub Code Spaces here. And if you didn't catch it, actually, a GitHub Universe um, just last month, we announced individual users get an allowance of code spaces for free. So you might want to go check it out. Awesome. So let's actually go and make some changes here. And before we do, let's maybe just refresh what a workflow file is, how this all works, etc. cetera. Um, so you may remember that within your repository, um, you'll have a number of different files, of course. That'll be your codes. That'll be your bicep templates, et cetera. But you'll find in your repository, you've got this .github folder and then a workflows folder underneath that. And that's where your GitHub Action workflow files live. And you can see underneath that, we've got a workflow YAML file there as well, which is what we've got on screen. And just as a quick recap, um, this is called a deployed toy website test. That's just a friendly name we've given it. Um, we've set some concurrency there. So if there's multiple workflows running at once, um, only the latest one will run at once is kind of what we're saying there. We have some kind of trigger, so on a push to a main branch. Um, permissions would have been covered last time, and we'll maybe come back to that a bit later. Um, and then we've got some environment variables. So think of them as like that piece of information we want to be able to reuse throughout our workflow. Now, on the jobs, you can see we've got a few different things going on here. So let's start with this first section um, to do with deploy. And you can see that indentation here is super, super important. Um, for anyone who's used YAML before, you might have strong opinions on this. Um, YAML does rely on um, you know, very clear indentations. So if you are following along, be very careful with your copy and pasting, um, because depending on the white space that you've got there, um, and you know whether it's tabs or spaces, not going to do that argument here. Um, this could really take, yeah. cause you to tear your hair out there, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I've been there, and I know lots of people who've been there. But you can see, you know, we've got this one indentation level here for deploy, and deploy is not like a special um, keyword or anything. That's just the name of uh, the job that we've created here, and then. Nested under that, then, we've got this runs on property. So what we're saying is, hey, GitHub, these set of steps I'm going to tell you to go and execute, um, run that on your Ubuntu latest runner. So that is a runner which is hosted by GitHub and um, happens to be running the latest version of Ubuntu. Then we've got a series of steps. And you can see this is an array. Um, and the clever trick for anyone who hasn't used YAML as much maybe in the past, um, these dashes show that there's an element in an array here. So Step one, step two, step three. So what we're doing, we're checking out the repository, going to log into Azure with some secrets that, of course, we've already added. And then we're going to deploy our website. That's ultimately what we're doing here. So overall, thinking about jobs, we've only got one job in our workflow file right now. We've got this deploy job here. So let's start making some changes and getting this working. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to update this Azure resource group name to be Toy Website Test because we want to update our test environment first. And we talked a little bit earlier that we've got different stages that we might want to go and work on. So we might have a, a linting stage, a validating stage, a what-if stage as well. So what we can actually go and do is in the module here, we've got a few different jobs. And we want to go and copy in this linting job here. Now, of course, before we actually go and deploy anything, we want to go and run some kind of checks. We want to make sure that uh, you know we're OK to actually go and deploy rather than go straight away deploying to our test to our production environment. And that's what this linting step is doing here. So, Chris, will linting help us with things like you know if the bicep file itself just isn't valid, right? This is this is something that we'll find out if we put some keywords in that aren't going to be parsed by the by the by the bicep system. 
Right. And and this is it, is it helps you make sure that you've got a certain level of standards being met, like a quality bar effectively ahead of time there. So, um, you know, rather than having to get to production, let's say, and find that problem, um, you're finding it a bit earlier there as well. So that's one aspect. The other thing that we can do as well is maybe add a validation step in. Now, right now, just to kind of link back to what you were saying earlier, John, right now we've got a challenge before we even add any more jobs or anything in here. So we've got a linting job, we've got a deploy job, but there's no kind of link between the two here, right? So what's going to happen right now is we save this file, we commit it to the repository, what's going to happen? The linting job and the deploy job are both going to run at the exact same time. Now, of course, not ideal, because so if there is a problem, the right, project. then we'll, the deployment will run and, and the linting will tell us, but it'll be too late. Exactly. You know, we've already deployed or probably haven't deployed because there was an error. So, you know, everything's showing red on our deployments and our workflow at this point. So not ideal. So, again, you know, there may be some additional checks that we want to go and bring in here. So um, linting is one of them that we mentioned and here we go. See my copy and pasting issues <laughs> that I mentioned. So let me go and uh, red. copy this a slightly different way. There we go. Oops. Here we go. This is going to be fun. <laughs> this is going to test <laughs> us. Yeah. Um, so what have I done here? I think 25 uh, and 26 need to be indented as well by the look of it. Exactly. Here we go. So we'll do that again. 25, 26, and then we'll bring that in. There you go. Spot on. As we said, <laughs> white space is important with YAML. So, yes. uh, you know, do keep so an eye on that. Yep. So you can see here, again, what we've done, we've just added another job here. So this time we're adding some validate job as well. So first thing that we'll want to run, and we haven't done this yet, is uh, the kind of lint step. Then we've got a validate step as well. And then we've got the deploy step here. But again, we still haven't, let's say, um, told GitHub Actions workflows here to go and specify what order things are in here. So right now, they are still all going to run in parallel. We've still got that as a problem. Now, the way that we can do that is by using a keyword property called needs. And if we just jump into this deploy file and deploy file, this deploy job here, we just type in this needs property here. And you may have noticed um, this uh, kind of IntelliSense kind of scenario here has just popped up with the needs keyword. So go and tab on that, and it accepts an array. So what we can do is we could actually say something like, I want the lint job and I want the validate job to complete before we can actually go and run this deploy job. And that is the way that you start bringing this ordering in um, between these different jobs here within your workflow file. So that's kind of where we are with this. So we've got our linked job, we've got our validate job, and both of those will run in parallel at the very beginning of our workflow. And because we've now added this line 44, this needs property, and this deploy job is saying we need lint and validate to have taken place first successfully before we can actually go and execute this workflow. And that's how we do the ordering. Awesome. So let's just think a little bit more about the the um, the exact steps that we were running there, right? From a bicep point mm. of view, from an ARM deployment point of view, what we'll be doing. So when we're linting, um, and, and maybe if we switch back to the slides for a moment, if that's all right, we can uh, we can talk about some of this in, in a bit more detail. So when we're linting, um, the bicep tooling is actually running some, some validation steps on the bicep file, right? And the th kinds of things that it looks for are things like if we've got parameters that we've specified that we're not using, or if we're doing things that could be done in a better kind of bicep native way. So for example, if we're concatenating strings together, uh, bicep has a better way to do it, which is string interpolation. Um, if we're doing things that we know are bad practices, like, for example, if we're giving a default value to a secure parameter, right, that's generally considered to be a bad practice. So it's looking for a whole bunch of these different things. There's, I think there's maybe 20 of these different kinds of rules that mm. now runs over your bicep files. And, and Microsoft is constantly adding new rules as well as we kind of uncover further best practices. So that's what the linter is doing. Now, what, what the, the, um, the workflow that, that Chris just showed is actually doing here is running this az bicep build command, right? This is using the Azure CLI, uh, and it's running bicep build because bicep build 
implicitly runs this linter as part of the build process. Now, what's interesting here is the, the lint stage runs the build process and, and comp it essentially compiles that, that bicep file into an ARM template, but we don't actually care about the ARM template output, right? We're going to deal with that separately in the deployment stage. All this is really doing is running the linter to say, give me the, the information about whether this file is valid and whether it's following our best practices. So we're running a build process, but we're really only interested in the kind of the lint stage of that process. Now, one thing to be aware of here as well is that the bicep linter requires that we, or it, it's, it's kind of got some interesting behavior around what it considers to be errors and what it considers to be warnings, right? Um, now, for the purposes of doing pipeline deployments or workflow deployments, we generally want to be very strict. We want to find any kind of problem at all and treat it as if it's a, a really bad issue because we want to, to kind of get that visibility as early as possible in our deployment process and in our, our coding process. So we can use this bicepconfig.json file to control how bicep treats all those different kinds of errors. And we can basically say every error is a, a kind of a, a, a proper error, right? It should actually block the deployment. It should be something that, that throws an error that the workflow will register and will, will then stop the deployment from proceeding. Uh, but you can choose for your own scenario what you want to consider to be errors, what you want to be considered warnings and so forth. Um, and also when you use this bicepconfig.json file, not only is it being used by the, the workflow uh, and, and uh, the bicep CLI, uh, but it's also being used by Visual Studio Code. And so while you're actually writing your bicep file, you'll get the feedback as well. So if somebody does ignore that feedback and commits the file anyway, the workflow acts as a backstop, but hopefully uh, somebody will discover these kinds of issues before they get to that point. So the second stage that, that or the second job that, that Chris just added there is for pre-flight validation, right? And this is um, another concept in, in ARM resource deployment that's, uh, that, that's worth thinking about a little bit more. So what we're interested in here is information that we can't just get from the bicep file itself, right? It's not just a standalone piece of information about the bicep file. So these include things like, are the resource names that we've specified valid? Right. For example, storage accounts aren't allowed to have store, uh, spaces in their names. So if you try to specify a space in a name, we want to find that out before we start deploying because that might have caused other issues. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other kinds of, of, of things that this helps us to discover. So pre-flight validation essentially lets us submit our deployment, our, submit our BICEP file to Azure and say, tell me what this would do, or uh, sorry, tell me whether this is likely to succeed and if there are any likely issues before you start deploying it. So it's similar to a normal deployment in that we have to link it to a, a workload identity because we're communicating with Azure, uh, but uh, it's something that, that doesn't actually result in any changes in our Azure environment. Now, the, the pre-flight validation and the linting stages kind of work together. Um, so if you run pre-flight validation, you kind of implicitly get the linting as well, but it's usually a good idea to, to run the linting separately just so that you're getting the output for that as early as possible in your workflow deployment. And I should note as well that pre-flight validations uh, really depends on the kinds of resources you're deploying. So I mentioned storage accounts, right? They perform a whole bunch of checks and will give you some really good insight into whether your deployment is likely to succeed. Uh, whereas uh, some, some other resource types don't do as many of those checks. So it's not absolutely guaranteed that if a pre-flight validation succeeds that you will definitely be okay. Uh, but it is still worth doing because that will pick up a certain class, uh, class of, of problems. All right, so we've we've added some of those uh, linting and validation jobs to our workflow. Um, so, Chris, did you have anything else you wanted to show on that, or should we move on to the next stage? Um, yeah, I think there are a few things we probably want to go and do awesome. here, actually. Um, Perfect. So, yeah, if we think about where we are with this, um, we've created um, those different jobs. We added the needs property, but didn't actually get around to creating the bicep config yet. So what I've just done in the background here, um, in the deploy folder, I've created this bicep config.json here. Um, and you can see this is how those 20 or so rules that you mentioned, um, this is how we specify that, hey, we want to treat all of those as an error rather than a warning. So you can see we're being particularly um, strict <laughs> in terms of uh, the outputs that we're going to get there and the outcomes that we're going to get. So let's go and save that. And let's jump back to the workflow file because 
if we think about this now, if we actually went ahead and ran that workflow and executed that workflow, what's going to happen? It's going to fail because there is an error coming back from the linter. And if GitHub Actions detects there's some kind of error, it fails the overall workflow. It fails the job, fails the workflow. And as a result, we won't be able to progress forward. So, you know, that would kind of end our session quite quickly here, John, right? So um, what we're going to do here um, is maybe let's just um, tweak things just for the sake of what, um, what we're doing. Down in um, this deploy website step, instead what we're going to do um, is change this fail on standard error to false instead. So we're just going to override that and say, you know, don't fail if there's an issue there instead. Going to make a slight little tweak with that. And at this point then, I think we're at a stage where we can go and commit this and take a look at what's going on with the workflow. So let's just go and give it a nice uh, commit method here. So we've added some lint and validation jobs. We'll stage all of those changes and we'll commit and push that back to GitHub. So what we can do at this point is we've committed that to our main branch. We've pushed it back to the repository. If we remember, what's going to happen? Well, because it's a push to our main branch, we should see a new workflow run being executed, right? So like magic. All being well, if we click this magic <laughs> button here, there we go. We can see that we've got a GitHub action workflow run being executed. So Ooh. if we go and click on that, now, oh, interestingly, we've got an issue. You know, we've we've just added our linting step in here. And you know what? Actually, our linting and our validation has gone wrong. Now, you know, that that is actually, in a way, a good thing. Right, if you think about it, because we haven't got to the deployment step and realized there's something wrong. We've realized that exactly as you're saying earlier, before we get to trying to deploy and doing something with our production environment that we're now causing havoc there, right? So yeah, what we can go and start doing is clicking into these and actually taking a look and seeing what's going on here. So we get the full logs from this runner. So we can see, for example, um, the custom bicep config file has been found, um, but there's actually some kind of issue here with our template. Um, we use this storage account name parameter. It's declared, but it's never used. Now, why is that throwing an error? Well, we overrode the error on the deployment side. We didn't override it on the linting side. So we still have to pass the checks in this linting step. So that's why that has actually appeared here. And let's just see what's going on with the validate step as well. Um, ah, the exact same issue there, you know, the template validation because it's detected that um, custom rules there. So we need to go and fix that issue. So let's go and jump back to the workflow file here and see what's going on. So it was complaining, if we look at our bicep code, it was complaining about the fact we've got some kind of parameter here for the storage account name. And it looks like uh -huh. it's this one that it is. It looks like it might be because that Visual Studio Code is very helpfully giving us a little red squiggle now as well. It right? is, isn't it? There we go. And look, if I mouse over there, it's that exact same error. Storage account name param is declared, but never used. So you know what? I think we can just get rid of that line, save that, and let's go ahead and... Um, commit that again, shall we? So remove, oops, remove and use parameter. Save that and push. There we go. And then let's jump back to our actions. And as if by magic, once again, there we go, running for us. And this is the power of automation and CI CD here in action. That pun was not intended. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we can see here now we've got the uh, the workflow which has been triggered. So let's see if we're any luckier this time. So we'll jump into the linting. Um, and usually what you can do is you can see the live outputs here. There we go. So looks like that one ran successfully. Which is yes, we've got a green check mark. Awesome. We love green. And here we go. Oh, 
Oh, that one's not so green. <laughs> so let's see what's going on here. Uh, so, da, da, da. ah, okay. So this is the interesting bit that you were talking about earlier, John. So linting is only half of the battle. Linting is only half mm. of the solution here. You know, it's able to help us understand, are we adhering to certain standards? But you can see what we've done, according to this error message at least, it looks like we've passed in some kind of storage account name that does not conform to um, the storage account name kind of um, syntax or the schema that's allowed. So storage account names must be between three and 24 characters and then numbers and lowercase letters only. So we've failed there, haven't we? It looks like we're passing in some uh, capitals there as well. So I think we need to go back and uh, make another fix. Oh, I think I can see what the problem is there. Mm, it looks like it's uh, that variable there, I think, by the looks of it. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to copy just this little snippet that I've got here. And all right, it's do... so we missed the string interpolation before. Yeah, well, not just that either. What we also did was we had capitals in there as well. Right. Which was uh, the challenge with the kind of the validation step. Oops, there we go. So we'll go and bring that in. And you know that's just using that unique string for us there then as well. So we know we won't be conflicting with anything already deployed in Azure there. So let's uh, fix the, not box, but fix the string <laughs> interpolation. There we go. Super. And now third time lucky, we'll go and take a look at that. So we know the linting was fixed. Let's see if we fix validation. Awesome. And it's really interesting seeing that as we're going through the stages, we're getting different kinds of errors, right? We're getting some types of problems showing up in lint, some showing up in validate. And then of course, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see more as we go later on as well. Absolutely. And that's the beauty, right? Is if you're getting different errors as you progress through, you know, you're making progress, right? You're not hitting yes. that same error over and over again. So, uh, you know, it Absolutely. might feel painful that you're still seeing errors, but actually that's a good sign that you're yeah. making progress. Oh, we go. and look where we're going. We are making progress, literally. <laughs> Fantastic. Super. Good. I think we're probably at a stage then where we can maybe think what we'd want to introduce next into the workflow. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk about the next step in our uh, our testing journey. Um, so we've talked about uh, about workflow jobs. We've talked about obviously validating and linting. Um, and what we now want to think about doing is is further increasing our confidence by knowing what exactly our deployment is going to be changing. Right, so we've, if we've already got resources in Azure, um, what are we doing now that is going to affect what's already in Azure? So we're going to learn about the what if operation. And we already spoke about this in the previous season of Learn Live. So if you want to refresh it, then uh, go back and have a look at that episode with, I think it was with Gitta and, and Alex Frankel from the Bicep team. Um, but essentially, the what if operation compares the current state of our Azure environment to the state that we've defined in our BICEP file. And of course, BICEP files def define the state that we want our environment to be in when a deployment ends. So all sorts of things can happen during a BICEP deployment, right? We might be creating new resources. We might be removing resources. In some cases, we might be deleting resources, depending on how we're doing our deployments. Um, and, and the what-if operation will basically give us insight into all of the things that are going to change if we deploy our BICEP file into the Azure environment as it is right now. So this is something that we can also introduce into our workflow. And there's a very good reason to do this, uh, which is that it gives us another chance to review uh, the quality of our, our deployments and, and make sure that everything is looking okay before we start uh, actually running the deployment, right? It gives us the ability to preview our changes. The kind of scenario this is really useful for is let's say that somebody has accidentally made a BICEP file change where they've renamed a storage account for example, in the BICEP file, right? In that scenario, all sorts of things could break in our solution if that was done accidentally. And so the preview stage really, or preview job really allows us to, uh, to verify all of the changes that are going to happen to make sure that each one looks reasonable for what we're trying to achieve here. So the what-if operation is similar kind of to the, to the validate in that it runs against Azure, right? So it needs a, a workload identity. It needs us to be connected to Azure. Um, but it, of, of course, it doesn't make any changes, right? It's, a, it's just comparing the current state to what we would do, which is why it's called what if. 
what we can then do is make a decision about what to do next, right? So having the, the workflow just give us an output of what if is is kind of useful, but if we're just going to proceed anyway, that's that's not particularly helpful, right? Because it might tell us, well, I knew I was about to to rename a storage account, but I went ahead and did it anyway. So um, we probably actually want to add an additional piece into this where we can decide, do we want to continue? So if we look at this, the, the workflow stages that we're progressing now, we've, we've done this lint, we've done this validate. Now we're going to add a preview stage or a preview job, sorry. And after the preview job, we want to have somebody manually go in, a human manually go in and say, does this look reasonable? Right now, in different scenarios, you might choose to allow this to happen automatically. Or you might choose to manually require validation. So, for example, and when we'll talk about this more next week, uh, in non-production environments, you might have a policy where you say, "Actually, that's fine. We don't care. We'll just allow that to go through regardless." We'll use the preview output, the what-if output, just to, as a as a part of the log. Whereas for production environments, you want to be very very careful, and so you might want to ensure that there's human validation going for each of these different uh, stages. So uh, you, can, you can kind of set policies on these for different scenarios, depending on what you're trying to achieve. So in order to, uh, to actually pr uh, approve these deployments and, and to add this kind of human check-in, um, we need to add in a couple of extra concepts in GitHub Actions. So the first one is what's called an environment. Now, an environment in GitHub Actions is really just kind of a logical representation of something that we're going to be deploying to, right? So there's, it's not a specific, it doesn't understand anything about Azure, it doesn't understand anything about any other place that we might deploy to. It's really just a logical representation to say, this is somewhere where we're going to deploy to. And then what we can do is we can create a thing called a deployment job, right? So we're going to switch our, our deploy job to run as what's called a deployment job. So there's normal jobs and deployment jobs. Deploy, the big purpose, for, for our purposes, the big difference is that a deployment job is associated with an environment, right? So you don't typically build against an environment, but you do deploy against an environment. So we're going to, to associate those things together. And then the environment allows us to put things called protection rules in place. And a protection rule essentially is a little uh, policy or something that we've said needs to, a condition that needs to be met before we will allow any changes to that environment or before we'll allow anything to work with that environment. So we're associating all these different things together, right? So we've got the, the deployment job, we've got the environment, and then we've got the protection rule against that environment. So Chris, it's probably easier to just show this rather than me talking. Do you want to go through that with us? For sure, yeah. Let's uh, jump across and take a look. So I guess from what you were explaining there, John, we've got the existing lint and validates jobs we've got the deploy job we need to have something in between so right. what i'm going to do is uh take a snippet here again and yeah here we go we <laughs> need to go and do some indenting there we go nice yep. and easy that time it's easy and one thing i'll note as well you can <laughs> add comments to yaml files as well which is really good because they can mm. get quite complex as you can see right we haven't done it yes. here but in other places you might want to do that indeed indeed so you can see what we're doing here um We've got the lint, we've got the validate jobs. Let me just close this to give us some more real estate. And we've got our preview uh, job here. So again, runs on Ubuntu latest. It needs that lint and validate um, jobs before it can go and uh, execute. Checking out the repository, logging into Azure, um, and again, using those secrets we added earlier. But again, this time using this what if uh, property that we mentioned a bit earlier here. So it's passing in those additional arguments there. Um, to uh, the kind of Azure Bicep command there for us there to go and get that what if output. So at that point, remember that the deploy job that we've got is also needing lint and validate. So currently what's going to happen is preview and deploy are going to run in parallel, which again, uh -oh. what we want. <laughs> so you know what, let's refactor that and just depend on preview instead. So there we go. Now we can see we've got this kind of logical ordering starting to come together here. So lint validate in parallel, onto preview, onto deploy. That sounds good to me. It seems like it fits the criteria of what we're looking for here. So at this point, that looks like it's kind of going in the right direction. Now, you mentioned there, of course, about environments. Let's jump mm. back to the repository here and take a look at this. So um, to get to environments, where you want to get to is um, the settings of your GitHub repository here. 
And as you scroll down on the left hand side, you can see you've got a number of different options. And one of those is this environments option here on the left. You can see right now, there are no environments. Now, again, just to reiterate what John said, nothing to do with like integrating into Azure or kind of whatever environment. And um, this is really a logical construct, a logical idea here. So we're going to go ahead, create a new environment here. And, you know, we're not going to make it anything special. We're just going to call it website here. Um, just clue is in the name. This is for us deploying our website here. Um, but of course, as we get more complex deployment workflows, we might create additional environments for different, uh, different environments, right? Indeed. So we might have like a test website, a prod website, a QA website, for example. But you know, for the purposes of what we're at least doing in this scenario, um, should be good enough here, I think. Great. Um, so what we can do, we can also add a required reviewer as well. And I trust myself, so <laughs> why not? We'll go and uh, add myself in. But of course, in a real world scenario, you would add, you know, some others, or maybe have like um, some kind of release approver, or someone who is responsible for checking over that, or a team, for example, as well. So, um, you know, for the purpose of this, again, we'll just make that myself, just to make the demo a bit easier. So let's go and save that. And you know, at this point, then we have this environment that's been created, but it's not associated with anything, right? It's not associated with the workflow that we just created a moment ago and that we just- Yeah, created. how would the workflow know to, to do anything? How would it know to require these reviewers, right? Exactly. So what we can do uh, in our deploy step, because again, the review that we have is going to be um, before that job actually runs, right? So what we could do is in this deploy job, we can add, there we go, uh, IntelliSense uh, helping us again here, environment property, and we're just going to call that website, just like that. So this is how we link the two together, because we called that environment, if we just jump back, website, and now we're kind of matching those two pieces of information together um, in the AML and in kind of UI there to give us what we need. So effectively, what should happen is lint and validate run. Um, then preview will run once both of those are complete. And once preview has completed, we then pause because we need to get that manual approval to go into the deploy stage, which is exactly what you were looking for there. Someone who can kind of put their eyes on it, check that the output is okay. And if they're happy, then it can go ahead, move along and progress then. So mm. I think that looks good to me. So I'm going to go ahead and push that again. And moment of truth time, as always. It's always a nerve wracking moment when you're doing CI, CD. <laughs> It is, especially when it takes a little while to get through, right? Um, <laughs> exactly. are, are we making any changes to the bicep file here, Chris? Um, I don't think we are at this point in time. I mean, we can um, to go and make a change. Um, I think, should we go and just see what happens first in terms of the output? Yeah, perfect. Okay, let's see what happens when, because yeah. the previous deployment will have already successfully deployed, right? So Indeed. hopefully the uh, what we're going to see here is is pretty minimal output. Indeed, exactly, exactly. So there we go. So we can see we've linted, we've validated. As we click into the preview here, again, we're just waiting for a runner to be assigned, and that was nice and quick. Um, yeah. What this is going to do is you know, log in to Azure again using those workload identities that we were talking about before. So no passwords. It isn't that awesome, awesome. right? You know, we're <laughs> able to deploy to the cloud without using a password. So... No more worrying about leaking secrets or things like that. No more needing or rotating to... them, renewing a them, doing exactly, them wrong. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, I I'm such a big fan of that stuff there. Um, ah, interesting. Have we got an error? No. So I think this might be the uh, the, the interesting thing about the the way the CLI works with Bicep, right? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so and we have got the fail on standard errors false. Yes, we did yes. set that in there. So yes. you know, whilst it looks scary when you're reading the logs, <laughs> we've still got green. We're still okay, right? Yep, so, still happy. Um, awesome. So there we go. So yeah, what we can do is take a look at the outputs now, because as you can see, to get into this deploy stage, I have to give the okay. I have to tick that and approve that. So mm. I need to do my due diligence at this point. So let me take a look at this what if. 
and see what's going on here. So um, it looks like there's, yeah, minimal changes. There's some kind of property changes here. Um, yeah. In terms of the website. So this is um, an interesting one, right? Because we haven't actually hmm. changed our bicep file. So this yeah. is, unfortunately, this is this is one of the, the ways that the, the what-if process works. So this is constantly hmm. getting better, but this is an example of what we call noise. Um, hmm. So there are certain times when we'll get told by what-if that something is going to change, even when it isn't. Um, we're aware, we as Microsoft are aware that this is a, a pain point and, and we're constantly working to fix these. If you come across these issues, you can report them. Um, and there's a link in the, at the end of this, uh, this presentation to, to do so. Uh, but these ones we're definitely already aware of. Okay. In which case then, <laughs> so uh, that's, that looks Excellent. good to me. So I'm going to go and approve and deploy that then. Um, so, you know, there we go. You can see we've had that very tangible step uh, between the preview and the deploy having to go and review and see, right, this what if output, has anything substantially changed? You know, have we, are we suddenly deleting a storage account or something? You know, that's when you probably want to start worrying or if you're creating mm -hmm. something brand new and you didn't actually, um, you know, change the bicep template substantially there. So um, yeah. yeah, we've added those extra checks in. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. That was very, very interesting. Okay, so let's think now about the next stage of testing that we might want to add, right? So we've, just to recap what we've got to so far, we've, we've linting and, and that's helping us to check to make sure that the BICEP code is valid and that we're following some best practices in BICEP. We've got validation to make sure that the resources that we have defined are likely to succeed in their deployment. We've got a preview where we can actually see here's what's going to change, right? So that's not exactly testing, but it's it's kind of in the same ballpark. So we, we, we think that's a good thing to add in here. Now, once we've actually deployed, right? So, so after that preview and that, that deployment that's that's been approved has run, sometimes we actually want to run some tests there as well. We want to check to see that the deployment did what we expected it to do. So, let's talk about how we might do that. Now, taking a step back, the goal for us here, when we're defining our resources in, in BICEP, we're not just there to, to create resources, right? We're, we're trying to do something that's going to bring value to our organization or to, to the project we're working on, whatever it is. We want to make sure that those resources are actually doing what we expect, that they're, they're going to do what we want. Um, and so we often will have requirements that we're trying to meet along the way, right? And these might be explicitly defined if we're in certain kinds of organizations, or they might just be things that we can kind of um, guess or, or can, can infer. Now, when we validate and, and lint in and preview our BICEP files, we're, we're gaining confidence that the resource definitions themselves are valid, right? And Azure sees them as valid, but it doesn't necessarily mean that those resources are going to do exactly what we want in our organization. So what we can do is we can add some tests to say, well, have these resources both deployed correctly and have they um, are they actually configured in the way that we want? Are they doing the things that we expect them to do? Now, it's really important to remember here that we're not here to test BICEP, right? We're not here to make sure that BICEP has actually done the deployments. We trust that BICEP, if, if we say to BICEP, go and do this thing, and then it comes back without an error and it says, I did it, we trust that it's actually done it, right? If we don't trust BICEP, we've got bigger problems, right? So, um, so we want to make sure that we're, we're not trying to test the tools that we're using. Instead, what we're doing is verifying that the resources that we've defined are going to work for our particular scenario and going to fit our requirements. So there's a couple of ways that we can do this. Firstly, we can think about things called infrastructure smoke tests. So these are tests that we can run that will help us to uncover any major problems in our in, in our deployments. So for example, um, if we're in our deployment, we might want to connect to our website and make sure we can successfully connect to it, right? And just get back our response. But not only that, we want to make sure that we get a valid response, right? We're actually getting an HTTP 200 or, or similar, right? So, uh, it, it, and that's because if, if, let's say that we successfully deployed our, our app service, our, our website, uh, but then we're getting back errors. Well, from Azure's point of view, it might be completely fine, right? They've said, well, I've deployed it. I'm, I'm, it's, my job's over. But really, we're not interested in fixing, uh, not interested in finishing there because something has actually gone wrong. So even when we're deploying very basic BICEP files, it's worth considering how we can validate the things that we're deploying to make sure that they've actually been configured in the way that we want. We also want to make sure that they aren't configured in a way that we don't want, right? If we've got undesired behaviors, and 
Again, we don't want to necessarily test every single permutation here, but we want to just make sure that some of the key things that we were interested in have been met. So we can run negative tests to make sure that things don't work in the way that we want. So for example, let's imagine that we were deploying a virtual machine. Um, so and with a virtual machine, the best practices are that we don't open that virtual machine up directly to the internet um, to allow it to be remote for a remote desktop or SSH, right? So what we might want to do in our, in our deployment process is verify that we can access it through Azure Bastion, which is a very safe process, right? It's that's designed for this kind of scenario. And then verify that we can't access it through remote desktop connection and SSH, right? So we might actually try connecting to it on some ports like, like port 22 for SSH, port 3389 for remote desktop, and verify that we're, that, that, that we're actually not able to, right? That's, that should be the result of those tests. That's why they're called negative tests. Now, there's lots of different ways that you can do this, right? And, and um, GitHub Actions itself doesn't have anything special here to, to, to kind of uh, allow you to do this. What we do instead is we use some of the, the scripting capabilities and the really powerful capabilities that GitHub Actions has for running custom scripts. Now, again, there's lots of different ways you could do this. You can write your own little bash scripts that, that you know, look at that try doing curl and, uh, and, and throw errors and so forth if you want to. We're going to use PowerShell and we're going to use a tool called Pester, which is an open source tool for testing for, with PowerShell. But of course, you can do what you want, right? I just want to make that clear. This isn't something that we're, we're saying. This is the only way to do it. So when Pester runs, um, it will run whatever tests that we've specified, and it will write the results of those tests to the workflow log. And what we want to make sure is that if there's any tests that fail, then we want to stop the workflow from continuing because we might have additional things that happen later that we don't want to proceed, right, until, until this has been resolved. And we also want to make sure that it's very clear in the workflow log something went wrong here, right? This is very important for us to, to go and fix. Now, again, there are other tools. There's another one called PS Rule for Azure, which you can also use to do similar kinds of testing. Um, and again, you can do this using, uh, just using custom scripts yourself, but I think Pester is a, a really nice way to do it. One of the things just to be aware of is that when you're running tests from GitHub workflows, um, bear in mind that sometimes you won't be able to access your Azure resources directly, right? If you've got things like virtual network integrated resources, then GitHub hosted runners might not be able to actually reach those. So think carefully about what these tests are doing and make sure that they're actually going to work within the constraints of GitHub hosted runners. And if they're not, you do have the option of running self-hosted runners um, for, and you can even run a mix of things, right? You can run GitHub hosted runners for most of your deployment and then just use self-hosted runners for the smoke test part of your workflow, right? That's a really nice uh, model. Um, but, but think carefully about exactly what you're doing. And if the, if the, the failures that you're seeing are really because of the failures in, in, in the test or if they're because of the infrastructure that you're running on. Okay, so that's the principle of what we're doing here. Now, before we get to that, there's one other thing we need to know about, which is when we've got these workflows with multiple jobs and we've now built up these you know, multi, fairly complex multi-job workflows, sometimes we need to pass data between the jobs. And this is going to be important here because in order for us to run a smoke test against our website, our deployment job needs to tell our smoke test job what website to actually test, right? Otherwise, the smoke test isn't going to know what to do. Uh, all, the, all the variables and all of the, the outputs and so forth, the deployment outputs, are not automatically passed between all of these jobs. These jobs are self-contained. And so we need to be explicit about how we do that. But luckily, there is a way to do that. So Chris, do you want to go through this with us? Yeah, for sure. So um, let's um, just take a look at what I've been doing in the background here. So what I've done is in this deploy folder here, um, I've just created uh, a PowerShell file here called website.tests.ps1, obviously our PowerShell file there. And I've copied in just um, a couple of tests. Um, you know, you explain there, Pester is one of the options we can use. So here's mm -hmm. what we're doing here. So let's just review what we're actually testing for. So um, a couple of scenarios. We're testing that uh, the website that we actually deploy, so again, these smoke tests that we're running are based on infrastructure that is already deployed. So you know we need to make sure that that infrastructure is ready for us before we can e even run this test, right? So um, first, we want to make sure that it can serve pages over HTTPS and B, 
and this comes to that security testing we mentioned a bit earlier as well, the negative test here is, is it blocking HTTP? So are we only serving traffic over encrypted means? These are really the two tests that we're checking for here. So that's kind of the, um, the actual test that we're going to be running here. And what we'll need to do is we'll need to start making some tweaks to our workflow file to actually make that happen. Now, um, there's a couple of things first that we'll want to go and do. Um, the first one is we'll want to add an output to our uh, deploy stage, because remember, as you mentioned earlier, we need to go and pass information between those different jobs. So the way that we can do that is if I just sort my indentation out, there we go. Um, you can see I've got this outputs property, and then I'm just making my own kind of variable name here. So I'm calling it app service app hosting. And what we're doing is we're referencing some kind of information within this job, within this specific job that we are executing here. So we're looking at the steps of deploy, and we're going to be finding some kind of app service app host name here. So that that app service app host name output is automatically set by the BICEP output, right? Is that and we're now right. propagating that essentially through the workflow. Right. So there's one more thing that we actually need to do here, which is we need to add the ID to this kind of step at the end here, because this is where right. it's coming from. So, so it just lets us reference that particular step, right, to say we exactly. want this output from this step. Yeah, that's it. So it's cool. the steps here and the deploy here. And then within the bicep file, I presume we've got some kind of um, output somewhere in here. So app service host. Maybe. Looks like we might need to add it. Oh, no, there we go. There we go. Oh, there it is. Okay. I guess uh, <laughs> I didn't capitalize something there. But you can see it's just an output from the bicep file there. Awesome. So, yeah, what we're doing is we're taking that out, um, pulling it up so that then at the kind of GitHub Action job level, we know that is then an output that we can pass to other jobs in GitHub Actions then as well. And one of the things I find most interesting about this is it's very clear here, we need to be very explicit about all of these things, right? It's one yeah. of those things where when you're deploying manually, if you're doing this all through the portal, you probably aren't even thinking about, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm taking this thing from here and I'm putting it here. GitHub Actions really forces you to be extremely uh, specific mm. about what you're doing, which is a good thing because then you make sure that you're not doing anything extra that, that might be an unintended kind of consequence, right? So uh, it okay. does feel a little bit painful, a little bit um, difficult to, to, to do all of these extra steps to kind of pass outputs around, but it is a worthwhile thing to do. Yeah, and I think once you've automated it, you know, the way I kind of look at things like this is there's the upfront pain of having to kind of get this set up and mm. configured as opposed to, you know, something goes wrong in the production, we need to manually deploy it and we need to go and do all of those steps individually time after time, manually again and again. You know, we go through the pain once to find it, got it all sorted in our workflow file here. Guess what? If we've, you know, done it in a way that we've been rigorous enough, it's going to keep working. It's going to keep uh, running for us. I've had workflows and pipelines in the past that I haven't touched in like 12 to 18 months that I run them and just mm. works exactly as it was before. And this is awesome, the right? beauty of this. Right. Yeah. So let's uh, let's go and add one more job in here to actually go and execute those uh, kind of tests there. So let's just check we're on the right indentation level. Yeah, we look good there. So um, we're adding on this additional job for, called Spoke Test. So it runs on Ubuntu latest. So again, one of those GitHub hosted runners, not a self-hosted runner here. So because this is a public Azure website we're deploying, you know, we don't need to worry about the access really. Um, that's not a problem for us. But like John was saying earlier, if we were deploying to something like on-premises or something private, mm. we'd need that runner to have kind of line of sight for the deployment aspect there. So it needs deploy. So the smoke test isn't going to run until the infrastructure is deployed. We're going to check out the uh, repository there. And then we're just going to run some kind of PowerShell there. So what it looks like it's doing is it's running that PowerShell uh, file that we've got there, but it's passing in a parameter. It's passing in a host name. And guess what? It's bringing in that reference from that previous job there. So it's looking at the needs. It needs the deploy step, the outputs, and the app service app host name. Oh, look, it, it actually makes some sense in terms of that notation and where it's coming from there. <laughs> 
So then all it's doing, invoking Pester with our container in a CI mode, I'm going to run those uh, tests for us. And then all we need to do is uh, go and run that in a PowerShell mode there. And that's what it's doing for us. So all right. I think at this point, we're probably at a stage where we can go and try it out and actually test it. Let's so, see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. So let's actually commit that at the test job. And there we go. That is now committed. So let's go and take a look at actions. So there we go. Right. So we've got an additional job there. This is starting to look like uh, quite a rigorous pipeline and kind of workflow that we got going on here. It is. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff going on now, isn't there? There is. So we've got our lint and validate stage. Um, so that's going through. Again, we know the preview job all works fine. Um, then it'll need to go and deploy, et cetera. So I guess one of the things I'm going to be really interested in here is we had two tests. We had one which tests that HTTPS works correctly, mm -hmm. and we had one which checks whether HTTP explicitly is not allowed. Um, right. Now, I'm not sure that in our bicep that we actually covered that scenario yet. Mm, I guess we'll find out, won't we? Mm. I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. partly expecting something to go wrong here. So, um, well, and this is exactly why we want the the tests, right? We want to be able to verify whether this is uh, the behavior that we're expecting is actually what we're seeing, and, and especially for things like security checks like this, uh, it's a it's a very worthwhile thing to make sure that we're we're being explicit about all of those assumptions that we want to meet. And this is the beauty, right? Is you know, there could be a lot of complexity in these bicep files or um, whichever infrastructure as code provider you're, you're using, right? And if you were changing like a variable or parameter or whatever it may be, um, or even if you're not familiar with the bicep file or the infrastructure as code, you know, you might change something and not realize the implications of what you're changing. Mm. So this is why having those tests as part of this process is really valuable. You know, think about this maybe not as a production scenario here, mm. but think about this as like, again, that kind of pull request flow, that pull request process where you deploy a site, which is like a temporarily a, a smoke test kind of site, check the infrastructure as code is all good, check the smoke tests are all valid and pass, and then you merge it into production after that then. So, you know, you never even get that code to enter your production code base until you've got to that point really really powerful in terms of that process. yeah absolutely yeah yeah and i think as we as we start to layer on additional pieces here we'll talk next week about environments and then we'll talk about some other things in future sessions you can start to see all of this coming together right it's it really makes a really really powerful um uh, workflow and and process when you can take all of these different pieces and, and add all those testing in at different stages and as chris said for pull requests for, for non-production environments and then of course production is the ultimate fallback Absolutely. So it looks like we're just uh, getting that deploy going through here now. So we've got uh, that step running here. So we're very right. nearly at the stage to find out how our yeah. tests are looking. You know, did we yes. did we pass? Did we fail? We're going to find out soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm 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 anticipating. It's uh, I know. It's exciting, isn't it? <laughs> I feel like we're uh, we're really building this up here, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> It's Absolutely. like a real production deployment here. And we might want to think about like in other scenarios, what are other kinds of, of negative tests or smoke tests that we might want to run, mm. right? Because, um, oh, there we go. The deployment succeeded. Let's see what happens here. So in other scenarios, we might also want to check things like, you know, we don't want to access the database server directly. We only want the application to access that, right? So we want yeah. we might try and actually poke into the database server and make sure that we don't get a response um, yeah. or any other kind of internal components like that as well. Hmm. Interestingly, apparently we passed both of those tests. Fantastic. Well, there we go. So the bicep file was obviously configured the way that we wanted. Very good. Yeah, there we go. Cool. So, yeah, we can see there are two tests passed. Now, of course, in a production environment, I'm guessing you probably will have more than two tests, right? We, we saw those pester tests um, that, that Chris had defined, which... Uh, which, which talked about that. But, but yeah, we can, um, we can imagine that in a, in a production scenario, we might have a lot more than that. Nice. Very good. All right. So let's um, finish up by talking about one other concept that um, that's probably worth un worth knowing about. We're not going to do a demo here because this is this is probably a little bit off off track, but it's it's something that that comes up a lot, which is around 
let's imagine that our, our workflow deploys successfully, but our tests fail. What can we do there? Um, and, and what kind of options have we got to roll back? Now, um, we, we do have the ability, as we spoke about before, to create things called rollback jobs. And we can do this at any point in our in our workflow, right? We can we can do this at the linting stage if we want to. Uh, we might have something that we want to do if if a particular job has failed. Uh, but typically, we will do this towards the the end of our uh, workflow or or at critical points in our workflow to make sure that we're uh, we're doing anything that needs to be done to clean up any resources that have failed. So. Um, in this case, this this particular example that we've got on, on screen at the moment depends on that smoke test job, right? So this is going to run after the smoke test job in that sequence. And if you if you we were to put this into our workflow file, that nice little diagram that, that GitHub Actions gives us showing us the sequence of all of our jobs, this will be right at the end. Now, one of the things that's interesting to note is that GitHub Actions stops the workflow whenever a previous job fails, right? By default, uh, this is its default behavior. So what we need to do here is explicitly put in an always condition to say, we actually want this job to run even if another job has failed, right? Even if a preceding job has failed. So if we don't do this, then the, the GitHub Actions would just skip this rollback job entirely. So we actually need to have this kind of always, and we are, so we want to run this always, but also only if uh, the previous or the, the smoke test job has failed, right? So it's a slightly funny kind of condition, um, but this helps us to get the combination of things that we want. Now, the, the, the thing that gets really tricky is figuring out what it is that we do once we've actually run this job, right? What, what steps will this rollback job do? And the problem here is that rollback is really, really hard, right? It's really challenging to figure out what you should roll back and how and it's particularly important to, to think this really think through this really carefully with uh, bicep deployments and deployments where you've got things like databases and application infrastructure and code, because you can end up in a state where some of your deployment might have succeeded and other parts have failed. So what happens, for example, if your bicep deployment succeeded, but your code deployment failed? Well, should you roll back your bicep deployment? Is that actually going to delete resources that, that you're, you're now depending on elsewhere? Um, if you do this, are you going to uh, upset things in your database? Have you made database changes in your deployment process that you now somehow need to roll back as well, right? This gets really, really complicated. Um, so for this reason, many organizations are, are kind of moving away from this idea of rolling back from changes that have failed. And instead, what we're trying to do firstly is emphasize testing up front, right? And, and really good non-production environment testing and pull request validation, all the things we've spoken about today. But then if there is a problem in production, then rather than trying to roll back to a previous version, we instead roll forward. In other words, we try and fix that change rapidly We've got all this automation we've built up to try and give us the, the best confidence we can that, that changes will, will improve. Um, so we want to make sure that we, uh, we, we fix that issue or whatever it is, uh, and then uh, roll that forward, right? Uh, create a new version that builds on the, the previous failed version and that, that fixes the issue and redeploys. So that often is easier to reason about, that's easier to build, that's easier to test. Um, and then the other thing to hear as well is that if we do have these scenarios, we want to make sure that we're using our DevOps mindset, right? We want to learn from our mistakes. These mistakes will happen, right? That's in a complex scenario like these kinds of deployments, like Azure infrastructure deployments, things will go wrong occasionally. The key thing we need to do is make sure that we don't just forget the lessons we've learned from those failures. So this is the really nice thing about being able to, to put all this automation into our workflows is we can then add in extra pester tests or we can add in additional linter rule validations in the bicep config.json file, or we can do whatever we need to do in our workflow to avoid that same problem happening again, to detect it and then to, to stop the pipeline or stop the deployment early. So that's a, a really important point to kind of internalize because this is hard to demonstrate, right? It's hard to think about exactly how this will work for any given scenario. This is something that really you need to have as a, as a discipline uh, as you're starting to build these, these workflows out in your organization. Yeah. All right. I think we are ready to see how much people have learned, Chris. So I would you like to take the first question? Absolutely. So, um, right. You've created a deployment workflow, and when you run the workflow, it fails when it reaches the deploy job. You see an error uh -oh. in the workflow log that's similar to the following. 
the provided location is not available for this resource type. And I have actually seen that. I'm sure you have as well, John. <laughs> I certainly have, yeah. <laughs> so you fix the problem in your BICEP file by changing the location property of the resource, and you rerun the workflow successfully. OK. So what could you do to minimize the chance of this error happening again? Could you add a required reviewer protection rule to an environment that you use in the workflow? Potentially an option. Mm -hmm. Could you run pre-flight pre validation within your workflow? And could you add a rollback job to your workflow? Okay. Interesting. Mm. So I noticed that linting is not one of the options here. So mm. obviously the linter wouldn't catch this kind of issue, right? So it's if you provide a location that's not valid for a resource, the linter won't know about that. But I wonder how early in the process could you learn about this? And that, that's exactly the question, isn't it? Is how early can we get where we can actually um, check on that in some way? Mm. So let's see the yeah. results here. Okay. Well, we've got one vote in so far. If, uh, mm. Maybe we can give it another moment to see if anyone else wants to weigh in on what their <laughs> thoughts are on this. Okay. Looks like we've got one vote for B. So, Indeed. Chris, what do you think? I think that B would be a very good answer. Um, <laughs> because if you think about it, the pre-flight validation, what we were looking at earlier, is able to do that, not deployment, but send something up to Azure, as you rightly mentioned earlier, uses that um, those kind of identities to log into Azure, send the scenario up, and then able to give that validation of, oh, if you actually go and run this, if you actually go and deploy this, you're going to get this issue. So it doesn't deploy it, but it gives you almost everything you need to know will it deploy there. Um, so yep, pre-flight validations looks like a good uh, good option there. Awesome. And you can see that combining all of these different uh, types of testing is, is giving us a lot of power, right? We're testing all sorts of different things. We're coming at it from different angles to see, you know, what is, is our deployment likely to succeed? Mm. Okay, so the second test, the second question here is what is an example of negative testing? So we spoke about this a few minutes ago. So would manually approving a workflow run be an example of a negative test? Or would rolling back a deployment of something fails be a negative test? Or C, verifying that a website is only accessible by using HTTPS and not by using HTTP. Mm. All right, let's see what the answers are for this. All right. It looks like we've got a couple of answers in. Now, Chris, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think that, that manually approving a workflow run would be a negative test? No. I mean, you know, that, that doesn't really have anything to do with testing, really. You know, that's just um, something we can do to get someone to kind of check an output. So I don't think that'll be it. Um, mm. And rolling back deployment if something fails. I mean, obviously, something failing is negative, but... Rolling mm. back isn't really testing, so it kind of implies to me that C, because you know we're testing a HTTPS, so that's the positive happy path, but the not by HTTP sounds like the negative testing to me. Mm. Yeah. Well, it looks like both of the people who responded to this have agreed with you, so excellent. Nice. Good work, everybody. Awesome. I guess then we've got one final question here. So um, which of these statements is true? So... The bicep linter needs to be installed separately to bicep. A template with no linting warnings or errors is guaranteed to deploy successfully. And linting ensures that your bicep file meets a minimum code style quality level. So, John, what's your kind of gut instinct there? Well, I would really like it if the linter gave us a guarantee that our deployment was going to succeed. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm wondering if that's actually a reasonable expectation, but it would certainly be very nice. Mm. Um, and then the bicep linter needing to be installed separately to bicep, I guess one of the questions then is, well, how would that get onto our GitHub Actions runner in that case, right? Would, would that actually be something we'd need to explicitly install? And did we do that mm. in our workflow? Indeed. All right. Well, we've got three people voting, and should we see what the correct answer is? I think we should. There we go. Spot on. <laughs>
Excellent. Yeah. So again, linting and, and validation are kind of two different processes, but even though they, they can, they, we've run them as kind of one, one uh, piece here, uh, but linting helps us to just ensure that the, the bicep file meets this, this basic quality level. It has a, a code style kind of uh, aspect to it as well. Um, and then of course, validation, pre-flight validation does what we talked about before, where it actually submits the deployment and, and uh, checks that against what Azure thinks will happen. Nice. All right. So today we have done a whole lot of things to our workflow, right? We've taken that basic workflow that, that April and Gitter started with or were finished with uh, a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, last week, we obviously extended it slightly to, to use um, uh, workload identities as well. But today what we've done is we've we've added bicep code linting. And we've, we've done that as part of that continuous integration process, right? Where we're, we're building, essentially validating our, 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 our bicep code just by itself, right? We don't need to communicate to Azure to do that. Then we added pre-flight deployment validation. And we did that uh, during, um, during the, the process as well. We added what if checks um, to preview what deployments our, uh, our, our, our sorry, what, to preview what changes our deployment will make. Uh, and we also added some manual approval steps in there as well to make sure that the right people are actually going to review the output of that preview as well as anything else in the deployment log uh, before continuing to the actual deployment. And then we ran tests to verify the configuration of our deployed environment to make sure that that you know we were meeting some of the requirements that we had that wouldn't necessarily be captured by Azure. So we've done a lot today, right? We've added a lot, and you mm. can see the complexity of our workflow has started to increase quite significantly. And what I love is it's all being focused on quality, and that's really the idea behind all of this, right? Is making sure before we get to that stage where we want to deploy. Is everything looking healthy? Is everything looking okay? Um, so definitely think about how you can bring those practices into what you do day to day as well is what I would say. Absolutely, yeah. No, and and as over the next few weeks, you'll see even more emphasis on quality as we talk about things like non-production environments, using pull requests and and automatic validation of pull requests, uh, and all sorts of other things that you're going to be learning about too. But I'm getting ahead of myself because I just want to remind you that of course this this is a fairly complex topic, right? There's a lot of stuff here to to, to understand. Hopefully, we've we've helped you to explain the concepts. Uh, but if you want to follow along then you can obviously follow along with the learn module um, uh, and, and run all these exercises yourself and actually try out all the things and, and deal with all of the YAML indentation uh, <laughs> issues that, that we've had along the way as well. Uh, you can also review these resources uh, which have additional links to more information about some of the things we've talked about too. And this is at the end of the learn module. So if you follow the learn module, you'll see this too. So uh, once again, um, please uh, please go to that learn module. Also, um, please rate it as well. It gives us really good signals as to you know, what, what works well in the learn module, what doesn't. If you've got feedback, you can provide that uh, through that process too. So we're going to take a break for the next few weeks um, because of the Christmas, New Year holiday season. Um, and so back in January, on January 11th, uh, we'll be talking about the next stage in our workflows, which will be to manage multiple environments by using Bicep and GitHub Actions. So we're going to build on the concepts that we've learned today, um, but start to think about how we can have our, our one workflow deploy out to you know, various non-production and then also production environments, uh, and how we can do all sorts of interesting things like having different parameters or variables for each environment, uh, how we can reduce duplication of our code so that we're not writing the same code all the time for each environment, uh, and a whole bunch of other things. So please join us for that in a few weeks. Uh, but for today, I think all that remains is for me to say thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Chris, for all of the awesome demos. And we'll see you next time. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thank you, folks. Goodbye.